I know, I know, this video is extremely long and I'm so sorry about it, but I couldn't shorten it even more since we're going to talk about the entire history of the VAT. Well, this is just part one, anyway. Before we begin, this is a theory video. I use the information available in the game and my own research to come to my personal conclusions and theories. In this video, I also use some illustrations I did for a video that I never uploaded, and there's also some Latin translations. I guess this has become a recurrent thing on my channel at this point. Without further ado, let's dive deep into the history of Tevat. Let's start with the first chapter of the history of Tevat, which I'll call the Primordial Age. An extremely long time ago, the Eternal Throne was wandering in the cosmos and found a planet that would be called the Old World. It had seven nations ruled by pure elemental beings, the seven dragon lords. From the Eternal Throne, which I believe was something like a godly spaceship kind of thing with an entire civilization in it, the Primordial One appeared and it, I'm going to say it just to make things easier, created four shades of itself, four beings that were both the Primordial One itself, but also totally independent beings. You know, like the Trinity in the Catholic Church, where God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are both the same being and three different beings at the same time. Of the four shades, we know the names of only two, Phanes and Kairos, which is Isteroth. Panes was born of an egg, it's androgynous, has wings and a crown. It should have broken the egg to create the world, but it decided not to, so it created a microcosm, what we would call a domain, to separate its creation from the universe. This is the new world. When we talk about Greek gods, there are multiple theogonies, poems that describe the origins and genealogy of the Greek gods. The one that's most relevant to Genshin Impact is called Orphic Rhapsodies, basically tales told by Orpheus. In the beginning, Kronos, time, and Ananke, necessity, gave birth to Aether, the pure air breathed by the gods, and Chaos, oversimplified it's the universe. From these two, a silvery egg was created, from which Thanos was born, the first king called the firstborn. He had wings, he was androgynous, and he had four eyes. He created a place for the gods, and he made a separate world for the mortals. In this theogony there are six kings in total, but only four are actually relevant when it comes to the creation of everything, the primeval gods. Phanes, Nyx, Uranos, together with Gaia, and Kronos. The first king was Phanes, the second king was Nyx, the goddess of the night and the mother of dreams. Phanes gave her rulership, his scepter and the gift of prophecy. The third king was the couple Gaia, the earth, and Uranos, the sky but also the limits of the mind, who was the actual king, both born from Nyx but also married to each other. There's also a long story about Gaia's kids, the Cyclops and the Hecatonchires, that Uranos imprisoned in the Tartarus because of a premonition of one of his sons overthrowing him. Gaia then birthed the Titans, who castrated Uranos. But I don't think that's relevant right now. The fourth king is Kronos, the god of time, who, with the goddess mother Rhea, gave birth first to Estia, Ira, Pluton and Poseidon. He also received an oracle telling him that one of his sons would have dethroned him, so he started swallowing his kids alive. Rhea had another child, Zeus, she gave Kronos a rock disguised as a baby to swallow, Kronos threw up all his kids, still alive, and years later, when Zeus was older, he also castrated Kronos. I guess that was the trend back then. Anyway, back to Genshin Impact. My theory is that the four shades of the Primordial One are Phanes, Nyx, Gaia, rather than Uranos, and Kronos. My second theory is that Istaroth is Kronos, for obvious reasons. And let's also remember that Kairos, the other name for Istaroth, has two meanings. In ancient Greek, it meant the right, critical, opportune moment, while in modern Greek it means the weather. Hence, Istaroth is the god of wind and time, I suppose. The sustainer of heavenly principles is Gaia, because she can move things with her cubes, and the cube is also the symbol for Geo, so Earth. The weaver of fate is Nyx, which I believe her to be Paimon, since she's accompanying us as we define our fate, but also because the goddess Nyx, in Hesiod's Theogony, is believed to be the mother of Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos, the Moirai, or Mire, the three weavers of fate, the personifications of destiny. Phanes, on the other hand, is the world tree. Hear me out, whenever a living being is born, they have to break their egg and come out. This happens in humans as well, when the amniotic sac breaks, you know, the water breaking, so that the baby can be delivered. Now, Phanes was born, but the egg was never broken. This must mean that Phanes is still inside the egg, inside the microcosm it created. 
Since finance is never spoken about after the creation of the microcosm, I guess it became the world tree, what regulates the cycles of Tavad and keeps the entire domain alive and stable. Back to the history of Tavad, the Primordial One fought the seven dragon lords for 40 years and emerged victor. He then created the heavens, which I believe then to be the loading screen, and he started reshaping or terraforming the earth. At the same time, together with one of its shades, probably Gaia, it created everything inside the domain. Land, mountains, rivers, seas, oceans, animals, and after 400 years, they created humans. I believe this is when the three realms were definitely established. The light realm, which is the world outside the egg, the human realm, inside the egg, the inhabitable half of the microcosm, and the void realm, still inside the egg, the uninhabitable other half of the domain. Considering how the abyss seems to be extremely toxic to every living being, I think it's some kind of power generator to keep the domain alive and stable. You know, like a nuclear power plant. It makes energy, but its radiations are extremely dangerous. Talking about radiation exposure, the description of the mask of the Kijing tells us that Chiyo was swallowed by a monster of the abyss. As a consequence, she was exposed to the abyss power, which completely changed her personality to the point that she, like many others who fought the abyss monsters, became a monster herself. Radiation exposure can cause psychological consequences, such as cognitive dysfunction. Another theory, I believe that the Eternal Throne was an ark looking for a hospitable planet. It's no coincidence that this chapter is called the Year of the Ark's Opening. This Ark contained the souls or the memories of the humans that would inhabit the bodies the gods created, because that's the only explanation I can find for the guy who wrote Before Sun and Moon, or anyone in general to know what happened in the beginning. And also the fact that Celestia goes aggro when it comes to this book. This means that what's written in the book is too accurate to be dismissed as fictional story. In this period, people worked the land, mined the ground, they got the first harvest and ores, and they even started gathering and writing poems. Also, very important, the people of this primordial version of Tevat lived in a unified nation that probably used Greek as their language. Then comes the year of Jubilee. If you didn't know, according to Judaism, every 50 years there's a Jubilee year, a holy year during which the land shouldn't be worked, everything was provided by God, and the slaves obtained total freedom. The Jubilee also has a completely different meaning according to the Catholic tradition, and it's a year where sinners are either absolved or punished for the sins. In Before Sun and Moon, in the year of Jubilee, people were given food and ore by the gods, if they were sad, the gods would talk to them and bring them happiness. Basically, the people were loved and pampered, but they had one single taboo, temptation. The Primordial One was so adamant about it that it sealed the path to temptation. This is basically the Tevat version of the Garden of Eden. Since the people obtain full freedom during the Jubilee, it comes as no surprise that the next chapter is the funerary year. The second throne of the heavens came and they started a war against the Primordial One. The heavens fell and the earth broke. Now I believe that this means that the heavens fell on the Tevat domain, which fell on the earth below and as a consequence the earth was cracked. The master domain Tevat, as I call it, was capsized when the heavens fell. We have multiple hints about this, like in Salvindagnir's story, when the chief priest went down below the civil tree, an Hermesul tree, to ascend to get closer to the gods to receive knowledge. Or in An Ode to Soul Light, we read, I have cleansed the abyss of heaven above, which would put the abyss above rather than below. There's also a hint in Albedo, Contemplation in Chalk, when we see Albedo floating in the sky with Mondstadt upside down in the background, and let's remember that he was created by Gold, someone who definitely knows about the true history of Tevat. Then we have Ankonomia and the upside down city in the chasm. Both of them show the same exact architectural style, so they probably belong to the primordial unified nation. If you noticed, this statue in the upside down city in the chasm, also visible in the Requiem of Echo in Depth cutscene, can also be found in Ankanomiya. The only difference, apart from the direction, is that in the cutscene, the statue in the chasm has something inside the cup, but just a few moments after, the cup is empty. Also, the defiled statue was hanged upside down by the Abyss Order, and there are instances, like here in Sumeru, where things are upside down on the ceiling. Last theory, I swear. In a previous video, I talked about Anthroposophy, a 20th century religion that used the Akashic Records to explain how humanity evolved. According to this, there are seven root races, which are evolutionary stages of human evolution. Now, the first root race is called Polarian. I think this, in Genshin Impact, represents all the primordial beings that arrived with the Eternal Throne. So the primordial one as well as, I guess, the three moons, the Sili race and probably the genie. The second root race, the Hyperboreans, I believe represents the humans that were created in Tevat. 
In the Akashic Records, it is said that humanity was guided by higher beings called Moon Gods. I believe these to be the gods of the eternal throne of the heavens, and probably the Sili and Genie as well. Also, the Sili race is described as an ancient civilization that traveled with humans, teaching them languages and philosophy of nature. In the Akashic Records, the Moon Gods didn't try to evolve humans' brain and reason, so, through time, a group of Hyperborean people began to develop their brain faster than the others. These people advanced so much that they went beyond humanity and were called Sun Gods in the occult science. They wanted humans to basically use their brains and they became divine creators as well as the Moon Gods. Both groups worked together for a time, but then the Sun Gods basically replaced the Moon Gods and took over creation. I think at this point it's clear what I'm gonna say. The Second Throne didn't arrive from somewhere far away in space, like the Eternal Throne did. They were humans from Tevad, who probably managed to unseal the path to temptation, obtain powers and decided to fight the Primordial One, replacing it in the creation of humanity. The last bit of information from Before Sun and Moon is that Enkanomiya fell into a dark place. I'll speak about Enkanomiya later in the video. We are now entering the second chapter of the history of Tevat, which I'll call the Anvoy Age. In this age, there were three moons in the sky, Arya, Sonnet and Canon. According to Moonlit Bamboo Forest Volume 3, the three moons are older than both Morax and the Bedrock of Liva. They switch places every 10 days and, if they didn't do it in time, a great disaster would occur that day. The Anvoy Age is tricky to explain and to make it easier, I have to start from the end. According to me, the Envoy Age ends with the fall of the Sili race, the death of the Three Moons and the descent of the Celestial Nails. The Sili, as Arama told us in the quest for the children of the past, were an incredible civilization of wisdom and beauty that was born with a curse. If they ever fell in love with a human, they would have lost their intelligence, strength, memories and bodies. As the records of GM Volume 4 tells us, obviously a Sili fell in love with a human, a traveler from afar, and they got married in a lunar place with the three moon sisters as witnesses. After 30 days, disaster struck. Now, something must have happened to the moon sisters as well, because disaster also would have struck if they didn't switch places in time. The Sili and the traveler fled into exile as the war collapsed around them. Eventually, the calamity caught up with them, and the entire Sili race, together with the traveler, were punished. The two lovers were separated for eternity and their memories were stripped from them, as well as the entire silly race. This reminds me of how the people of Kanria lost their bodies and transformed as soon as they were stripped of their memories. Here's my theory. The traveler from afar that fell in love with the silly is the first crown heir from the Battle Pass video that was sent on Tevat, and she doesn't remember that she's the heir of the throne because she was stripped of her memories. I also think she's the Queen of the Abyss Order, but that's beside the point. As I said, the three moons were caught up in all of this, probably the first moon forgot to switch places with the third one because... I don't know. Maybe the Sili's marriage convinced her to try and marry the star at daybreak that all three moons loved and she didn't check the time, who knows. Thing is, they fought and killed each other. The corpse of one moon is still in the sky, while the other two moons were disintegrated and their moon dust fell on the planet during Ruka Devata's time, as it is told in the description of the weapon Moon Piercer. Now we can go back to the beginning of this age. The Envoy Age was a time where the heavily envoys walked among the humans and the people could talk to Celestia pretty easily. In this age, I personally place the stories of Salvindagnir, the Tsurumi pre Thunderbird civilization, the ancient desert people, and the mountain tribe around the chasm. Let's start with Salvindagnir. We know that they fled a place of snow and strife and they found a lush green mountain, the ancient version of Dragonspine, and they settled there. To explain the story of this civilization, we have to take into consideration the description of the four tiaras, prayers of springtime, illumination, destiny and wisdom. Prayers of springtime, the tiara of frost, tells us that people can hear revelation from Celestia directly, that the envoys of the gods walked among the people and that the planet was blanketed in unending ice. This alone is enough to place Salvindagnir in this age, especially because of the murals depicting the civilization being in contact with Celestia and with the divine envoys. It also specifies that everything in Tevat works as a cycle, which is very important to remember. Every tiara also tells us that the chief priests, when they were about to die, went to a secret place beneath a withered tree to offer their crown of flawless white branches. This is the domain Peak of Indangnir, a festive site where priests ascended to face the heavens. Yes, like I said way before, they went down into a domain to get closer to the gods in heaven. The Tiara of Flames, Prayers for Illumination, describes the first flames that began to thaw the eternal eyes. 
Everything was decided by the gods and the envoys told the civilization that soon they would enter a new and brighter age. When the people started asking questions, Celestia didn't reply. Once again, the current chief priest was sent into the deep places of the world to seek answers and enlightenment, and to leave his tiara like all the chief priests before him. The tiara of Torrens, Prayers of Destiny, tells us that the first rains extinguished the flames and that everything was perfect and bountiful thanks to the divine law. This paradise on earth was destined to last a hundred years, so the people wondered what would happen after that, and Celestia pled the fifth again. Like before, the chief priest was sent to die in the domain. The Tiara of Thunders, Praise for Wisdom, tells us about the first thunders and lightnings. People enjoyed untold wisdom and that was their doom because they started asking even more questions. They even questioned the Eden's authority and they tried to invade the Garden of the Gods. Celestia was obviously heavily pissed and yet another chief priest was sent to die in the domain to ask for forgiveness. At this point, the story of the chief priest Farouk and his daughter happened. I suppose a hundred years have passed and the princess, the daughter of the last chief priest, was born under the once huge Irmansul tree, the Frostbearing tree. She was gifted with clairvoyance and because of it she saw a glimpse of the fight between Durin and Valin. She didn't know that that was going to happen thousands of years later, so she took it as an omen of imminent death. She kinda got it right, though, since not long after the sky frost nail came down and started freezing everything. Interestingly, on Vindagnir there was an outlander called Imunlauker. The princess gave him the Snow Tomb Star Silver Grey Sword and asked him to find a way to save the nation. He left, and from the perspective of the people of South Vindagnir, he never came back. Should I say it now? Yeah, I'm gonna say it now. Imun Lauker is probably the second crown heir from the Battle Pass, and he's seen near a lush mountain that could easily be Vindagnir. Anyway, a long time must have passed because when the trees started withering, Baruch decided to go to the top of the mountain to seek guidance, while his daughter was painting a mural of future events like she used to do all the time. Baruch hoped that she would paint the ice melting and clear skies, but, like the princess box says, she couldn't because it's been a while since I last saw the blue sky and green grass. The sky frost nail suddenly broke into three pieces and one of them destroyed the immersal tree, severing the connection with the ley lines as a consequence. The princess took the most complete branch and tried to graft it on another tree, but she failed and died next to it. Uko, the kingdom's scribe, the last person alive, buried the princess and cursed the entire world and Imunlakur who abandoned the princess. He also wishes that the new nation without gods that was being built, Sokaria, would have had the power to stand against the gods. When Imunlakur came back, everybody was dead. Interestingly, tainted black blood dripped from the blade of his greatsword. This kinda makes me think, does a cycle always end with the abyss monsters ravaging the world, summoned by someone? We did read about someone trying to enter the Garden of the Gods, so maybe that broke something that let the abyss through and the nails were just temporary fixes? This would mean that Kanria should also have a nail somewhere. If you're curious about the Latin inscriptions on the murals in Dragonspine, they say Juvant Angeli Fidelis, which means the faithful angels help, and Dicite Vos Voltis Sei Tace Audi, of which I'm not too sure about the translation, to be honest. I would translate it as learn if you want, don't speak, listen. To be clear, this doesn't make sense at all. Learn is imperative mood, plural form, so why is it a command if then you say if you want? Then, to make it worse, Tace and Audi are both imperative mood, but singular form. Say is the archaic form of the word si, which means if, otherwise it would have literally meant of seio, who was ascribed in a Latin text by Aulus Gellius. I'm not even sure about the verb to want, since it would have been vultis and not voltis, problem is that voltis means to a monster called volta, so it would make even less sense. But yeah, let's move on. I just realized, as I was making the video, that there's a clock on this mural. Was Esteroth involved in the story of Sol Vindagnir as well? Wow, she's everywhere. Imun Lauker left Vindagnir and we don't know anything about him anymore other than the fact that his descendants fought against the Corabian during the Arkham War. Tsurumi Island. I suppose this happened at the same time as the story of Sol Vindagnir. Here we find the pre-Thunderbird civilization, who lived beneath Shirikoro Peak. We know that they lived when the three moons were in the sky because three mirrors just say it outright. One says Diana Spueri Integri Puelleque Canamus, which means pure boys and girls let's sing of Dianas. Diana was the goddess of the moon, and here it's plural because there used to be three moons. 
This sentence is also taken from a text by Catullus, with the exception of Dianam, which was obviously singular. Another mural doesn't have the first two words, but it says Trivia et noce estis luminibus lune. We know what the first two words are because this is still from Catullus, and his version says Tu potens trivia et notho es dicta lumine luna, which means you, who are called pal for trivia and for the reflected light, luna. And mind that for the reflected light means something like fake light. As a consequence, since the entire sentence in Genshin Impact is plural and they removed dicta, it should mean you, plural, who are the powerful trivia and for the reflected lights, lune. By the way, Trivia is Ekati, another name given to the goddess of the moon, and she's always represented as three goddesses. The third mural says Lunarum sumus in fide, puelle et pueri integri, which just means we, pure boys and girls, have faith in the moons. This is what the other murals say, you can pause the video if you're curious. I don't think they're really relevant for the story, well, maybe just this one may be irrelevant, since it shows that they found out that the sky was fake. Anyway, we don't really know much about this civilization. We know that when it fell, even though they didn't die completely like in Vindagnir, Kapatsir was already alive and she nested on the island. From her memories we read that once strange objects fell from the heavens, one of which landed upon this island, after which your sky returned to its clear state. Afterward the fog started to emerge. So, as I guessed before, something like the cataclysm caused by Kanria happened at that time as well. In this case, we have proof of the sky turning black and the nail fixed it for a while. Then the fog emerged, which it seems to be the disorder caused by this specific nail. Also, what Kapatsir saw confirms my theory that this civilization existed in the same period of time and fell at the same time when these multiple objects from the sky, the celestial nails, fell on the planet. About Sumeru, we have even less information. We know from the description of Shadow of the Sand King of the Gilded Dreams artifact set that Sumeru used to be a normal place with trees and meadows and there was a civilization with a mortal king and clergy that received divine oracles personally. It seems like it's referring to the heavily envoys rather than people under the Scarlet King, honestly. Then a nail descended and destroyed the environment, turning everything to sand, thus creating the desert. It also talks about the sun falling and rising again and I think it refers to what happened in the chasm. Around the chasm used to live an ancient mountain tribe. The story takes place around 6000 years ago when Morax was still very young, which means that Kapatsir was older than him. This story has two versions to it. The Solar Relic, Vermilion Hereafter artifact set, talks about the solar chariot falling into a deep gorge, most likely the chasm it created when it hit the ground. The mountain tribe repaired the solar chariot and it turned back into the sky, while a piece broke off and the people grinded it and sold its dust. Since the chasm nail is very deep beneath the ground, I think that what the people repaired was one of the shards like the ones we repaired on Dragonspine. After they repaired the shard, it flew up and it cleared the sky, so the people thought that the sun chariot went back to the sky, while it probably just went back to the nail. In records of Julian, however, it is said that a star fell from the sky creating the chasm, and a fragment broke off, another shard that in this case crashed into northern Lycia, most likely the Yu ruins, where it stayed until the Archon War caused a flood and it went back to the nail. I will add Enkanomiya in this video even though the story goes from the fall of the Unified Nation to the Archon War. Enkanomiya's chronology and location are very strange and this is my personal interpretation. I believe that Enkanomiya is a domain that lies, like the developer said, at the borders of Tevat, the inhabitable half of the domain. This could mean that Tevat is right past Enkanomiya's borders, which is the interpretation I'm going for. Hence, I firmly believe that Enkanomiya is in the abyss protected by a bubble around it, like any other domain. Sumi confirms this in the quest Free Realms Gateway Offering, the Eve by saying that the three towers at the corners of Enkanomiya's triangular borders normally stop the Void Realm, the Abyss, from invading Enkanomiya. She also tells us that the Light Realm is where the Seven Sovereigns, the Seven Dragon Lords, lived, which is also where the Bathysmal Bishop came from. This means that when Enkanomiya fell, it brought down with it some Bathysmal Bishop from the Light Realm that found refuge from the war, and it fell into the Abyss. So, Enkanomiya borders with the Abyss all around and with Tevat above. Once again, this is my personal interpretation. Anyway, the story goes that the people of Enkanomiya found themselves in a very dark place, defending themselves from the Vishaf with lanterns. 
They prayed to the gods, but none of them replied, until one day when Aesaroth made an appearance and gave Abrax the knowledge to build the Dainichi Mikoshi, an artificial sun. Abrax became the leader and the people built the Dainichi Mikoshi, or the Helios as they called it since the Unified Nations language was Greek. The bishops were under control thanks to the light and some people decided to look for a way out but couldn't find any, so they thought that for whatever reason, it meant that the Primordial One won the war. I mean, if he had won, wouldn't he have saved them? Anyway, at this point, some sages convinced the people that the artificial sun was actually a god. They put a child, the sun child, on the throne and they used the child as a puppet for their own agenda. They took over the Dainichi Mikoshi and they decided when and how to use it. Abrax was imprisoned by the sun child and he was left to die in prison. After that, the scribe of the Tokoyo Okami, which is yet another name for Isteroth, says I must stop now, for I am not long for this world. And this is how Before Sun and Moon ends. In Before Sun and Moon, time is counted as the first year of darkness, the third year of darkness, the year of blindness, the year of sight, or the first year of Sun and Moon the second year of Sun and Moon, and the tenth year of Sun and Moon. We can interpret these years in two ways. One way is to actually consider them real years, so 14 years. Then Abrax was imprisoned by the first Sun Child on the tenth year of Sun and Moon, so the child was probably 11 years old and Sun Children weren't allowed to grow past puberty, otherwise the sages wouldn't have been able to easily manipulate them anymore, so they were taken to the Dainichi Mikoshi to be pulverized by its power, in a ceremony called the Rite of Solar Return. There have been six more Sun Children, quick math, a child is fully capable of understanding and speaking at three years old, and the first Sun Child ruled for at least eight years. Let's add two more years to make it even, so each child ruled for 10 years and died at 13 years old. Let's add 60 years more and we get to 74 years in total. Let's round it off to 80 years. The other way is to consider the years in the darkness as generations, since they didn't have anything to count the time until the Helios was built. So the first three years are three generations, which equals to 90 years. This makes sense if we consider that Abrax may be the sage who had once seen the sun in the parable of the sun, so he would have been around 95 years old and most of the people would have died by then. To these 90 years we add 1 year of blindness, 10 year of sun and moon and 60 years of sun children, so we're at 161 years. Whether it's 80 or 161 years, their story began when Celestia fought the Primordial One and ended when Orobashi unintentionally fell into Enkanomiya during the Archon War. So above ground, thousands and thousands of years, most likely more than 10,000 of years, had passed. As we saw in the quest Perilous Trail, sealed domains can have their own set of rules and laws, and even time could work completely differently, so Enkanomiya being a sealed domain as well could explain this strange time dilation. And this was part 1 of the history of Tevat. I really hope you liked the video and that you learned a lot about Genshin Impact and our own world. Next week I'll upload part 2, so the pre-Archon War Age, the Archon War, the post-Archon War Age and the Cataclysm. Part 2 will not have any new info available in version 3.1, so the week after I could talk about all the new pieces of information that we will get in the desert and, if needed, corrections about what I've said in these two videos. As always, if you liked the video, don't forget to leave a thumbs up and if you want to watch more Genshin Impact Theory videos, subscribe! Until next time, over and out.